Thank you again to the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art for inviting me to speak to those who have the courage for yet another hour plus on Zoom. Um, I didn't really conceive of these as a, uh, a series, but we have been really lingering in the years on either side of 1800. So early on, I want to show you a few slides uh, that will link the content of tonight's lecture, which is going to take us to a city that was really emerging through Prussian military prowess uh, on the world scene right at this point. Um, and I want to focus on a whole series of architects, most famously Gilly and his uh, pupil Schinkel, Schinkel who would in a certain sense imprint uh, Berlin in the years after the defeat of Napoleon in 1850 with the imprint of his architectural genius, but also his particular relationship to the classical past. The reference to Athens on the Spray is already one that emerges in the period that we're discussing when Berlin, sitting bisected by the River Spray, we'll be seeing it, um, becomes known as the Athens on the Spray. Uh, many cities, of course, claiming to be the um, in a sense, the recipients of the legacy of classical Periclean Athens, one thinks of Edinburgh a little bit later on, claiming this uh, right. In the case of, um, of Prussia, after 1815, this was as much through reform of, uh, of the relationship between monarchy and society, uh, the political process, and in particular, educational and cultural goals, which were going to be shinkles to express. This is going to, uh, take us to uh, an entire generation of students who were formed in a newly launched school of architecture, uh, with the exception of the French and some local Italian academies. In the 18th century, almost all architects were taught on the job. They were taught in another architect's office. They were taught on the building site. They were self-taught uh, architectural education uh, outside of Paris and a few small um, Italian cities. Um, really only begins to emerge in the years after 1800. So in this regard, uh, some German cities were precocious, uh, Berlin, Karlsruhe, and Munich in particular, and the Bau Academy was set up in the, uh, in the years around 1790. It came to be housed in two buildings that we'll see this evening, one on the left, uh, where the young architect Friedrich Gilly, who will be one of our protagonists tonight, uh, was not only a teacher, in the Bau Academy, which is housed in the upper floors of this very unusual interpretation of a rigorous uh, classicism of the mid 1790s, but also he would design the decorative frieze, which was a allegory on the relationship of architecture, not only to making, but to civilization. That building would be replaced by this much more monumental on the right, Bau Academy, which is the building that we'll end with this evening. So those of you who have to leave early and haven't seen this image again will know that you missed the end of the lecture. Those of you who see this building coming on the screen again will realize that the end is near. A fundamental rethinking of architecture that's going to move architecture into the classroom, it's going to move architecture into the world of learning, it's going to move architecture into a relationship to a, um, growing negotiation between traditional royal power and the emergence of state administration as a um, organized uh, bureaucracy, I suppose what our president would call the deep state, but in the late 18th century would be seen as the enlightened state of administration of which architecture was to play a fundamental part. So architects are part of administering um, society, administering the city, administering territory. We're going to focus largely on Berlin, but Berlin is the capital of an ever-expanding territory uh, during our period, um, even though part of it will be deeply upset by the Napoleonic campaigns, the uh, French occupation uh, of Berlin in 1806-1807, uh, and also the rise of Prussian nationalism, which will find its expression in architecture. Our two main protagonists, although I'm going to speak about many others in their, um, their orbit, very closely connected uh, group. By the 1790s, we find references to the Berlin School of Architecture, meaning not only the actual school in which students were trained, but the idea that there was a unity of purpose in this Berlin Klassizismus or 
neoclassicism uh, of the 1790s, which uh, we're going to trace some of its transformations in the hands of a group of people about, among whom perhaps the most famous were Gili on the left and Schinkel on the right. Um, teacher, mentor, and student, student whose fame and accomplishments in some way would outshine uh, the um, teacher by the time of his death in 1840. But what must strike you immediately are these two neoclassical portraits, Gili seen almost as a ancient Greek uh, poet uh, or muse of some sort, uh, wrapped in classical drape, perhaps part of a toga, in a conscious emulation of ancient Roman sculptural types, but with a new uh, romantic vigor uh, in the uh, COVID-19 disheveled hair and in um, his uh, romantic gaze. Uh, Schinkel on the right, not only in this uh, portrait of him as a public intellectual, public uh, figure, but also one who would begin not only to transform the city, but in some ways himself in the years immediately after his death in 1840 to become a public monument in his own right. So a creator of public monuments, a creator in a certain sense of the public sphere, uh, a transformer of the city of uh, Berlin from merely the seat or the residence of the monarchy into a place in which a new definition of an expanded citizenry as actors on the public stage was to be crafted uh, by uh, Schinkel. You see him here in two versions of a, a portrait by the sculptor Rauch uh, that were erected uh, after his death. Uh, you can see very clearly in the more detailed one in, uh, in marble on the right that he is hang, ha, handling a tablet. These are not the Ten um, Commandments of Christ or the famous Tablets of Moses, uh, but rather, interestingly enough, in this one, which originally stood in the, um, immediately before his museum, he, we can see the plan of the museum. We'll be returning to this uh, plan, which you can see uh, engraved or carved into the underside of this um, tablet that he's holding. In this other variant in bronze, uh, where the tablet is in a slightly different position, here is today positioned back where it originally stood before the bombings of the center of Berlin in World War II in front of the Bau Academy. I hope you can realize that this is not a solid building, but actually a one-to-one -one photograph of a group that hopes to uh, restore that building, uh, which was dynamited by the East German government around 1960, and has been now for almost 20 years the subject of a debate over whether or not it, like the palace in Berlin, should be recreated to replace this missing building block of what I will call Schinkel's Berlin or the Athens on the Spree. I suppose one question for us as you gaze to that simulacrum in the back, that image of a building that was made out of red brick and terracotta, how in the world would that style of uh, expression emerge from the idea of Athens? We're going to see that the concept of a relationship to the classical past, and in particular, its relationship to Prussia's aspirations, not only for power, but for industrialization, for modernization, in other words, for a kind of putting in motion of the 18th and early 19th century idea of progress will also affect the ideas of what is the classical language of architecture and what can it mean in a contemporary um, society. The last time I was with you, we spoke about the architecture of the French Revolution. I wanted to remind you not only that our story is going to begin during the very same decade when all of Europe was watching, either with exultation or with unbelievable nervousness, the unfolding of events in Paris, in particular uh, by 1793 with the emergence of the, the terror, what came later to be known as the terror, uh, and of course along with it the regicide, the killing of Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette at the guillotine. I'm evoking a equally violent but less deadly event, the taking of the Bastille in 1789, fascinatingly one that uh, stormed that old medieval fortress that was at the entrance gate to the city of Paris. In the very same year uh, in Berlin, where clearly Frederick William III, the uh, 
then king of uh, Prussia, was a ner a very nervous by this absolute confrontation with the very concept of the monarchy. The French were experimenting whether in fact power could be shared with the king until finally things became so violent that the monarchy was in fact abolished entirely uh, by the third year, third and fourth year of the uh, French Revolution. What happened in 1789 in Berlin was the beginning of a remodeling. I think it's uh, difficult to understand that remodeling if we don't understand it as a kind of, I suppose to take a word very much on our American mind right now, a kind of reckoning with what would be the relationship between the king and his subjects. The Brandenburg Gate was very much going to put Berlin under the aegis of classical antiquity. I think you probably recognize that this is a reworking uh, in this design by the architect Karl Gotthard Langhans. We'll see some other of his work in a moment. Um, of the famous propyleum of the Acropolis in Athens, at once in some of its detailing, archeologically accurate and erudite, although other aspects of it were rather freely interpreted, but not, Berlin would now be, the wall breached, would be entered through the sign of Periclean Athens, of classical Athens, with all of its association with democracy, even as we'll see, that square was one that was seen under the protective eye of the monarch. So this rethinking of the monarchy and this recasting of Berlin always with an awareness of what was going on in those precise same years, politically, architecturally, and urbanistically in Paris. We're going to even see a, um, a voyage to see firsthand what was going on in the French capital. So, that gate was situated right here on a city that had scarcely grown beyond its best expansion in the 17th century, a city with a medieval core uh, that had become over the uh, centuries since the late Middle Ages, the seat of the Hohenzollern family. Their power had expanded um, enormously through land conquests and wars, particularly under uh, Frederick the Great, and his father before him and son after him over the course of the 18th century, expanding particularly towards uh, the east. But much of our focus will be on the city itself with its medieval core. You can make out the fortifications still there on this uh, plan of the mid 18th century. This is actually published in English. Uh, the expansion of this looser fabric here and the laying out of what was called the Friedrichstadt, a kind of a planned new city long before Washington DC with this combination of a gridded plan and a, some uh, radial aspects, particularly from the southernmost of the three new city gates that were created in this expanded uh, plan. These are gonna be very important for us. The uh, situation at Pariser Platz or Paris Square with the main avenue leading out to the Royal Residences at Charlottenburg. Uh, here at the um, Leipziger and Potsdamer Platz uh, to join cities, uh, places in the place name because these were where the roads left for Potsdam, the uh, summer residence and um, in a certain sense joint capital, the Versailles uh, um, of uh, Prussia, if you will, here as well as the roads that led to Leipzig, um, in some ways an equally important city at the time, uh, and down here the so-called Rondelle, uh, which will be less in our story. So. Berlin had already been regularized and vastly expanded uh, in the period before ours. This is a map by the end of the 19th century, and you can see how Berlin is literally, since pink represents the density of settlement, uh, bleeding out. It's going to be useful for us because as well, it shows us the area where we're going to go at one point down uh, here on this series of high hills. One of them in particular um, will be a site occupied by a monument to Schinkel that was meant to make the ever-growing city comprehensible. So one of the themes as well is how can a city that is growing still have the figure of a knowable image, be put under the mark of Athens of the Spray, have something as clear as say the Acropolis, particularly in the relatively flat marshland of this city on the Spray River, between the Spray River and the Havel River coming in and forming the main water courses for the commercial activity. But let me show you here where we're going to be focusing uh, this evening. 
we're going to be looking here at this is the Berlin Palace. This has very much been in the news as a, ver a later version of it has been being rebuilt to replace the building that was demolished in the early 1950s by the German Democratic Republic. Uh, the Berlin Wall, of course, passed here. So everything that we're looking at at the moment was in the, what between 1949 and 1989 was East Berlin. Uh, we are this great axis of Unter den Linden, it connects uh, ultimately to Charlottenburg and to the royal residences out there, to the hunting grounds of the Tiergarten, and then becomes a processional alley towards the palace on an island in the Spray River where the spray bifurcates here and then rejoins in a, thick, uh, in a more substantial course of water down there. Uh, and uh, this um, area here, where you see there's already been carved out under Frederick the Great, a space uh, to create a transverse forum, what had been known as the Forum Friedrichianum, with the opera, a, a Catholic church, uh, and the academy buildings here. So we'll be looking at this place. Schinkel will be intervening here. And then we will also be looking at this square, Leipziger Platz, which will be a subject of reflection of both Gili and, um, and of Schinkel. Now we began our, our, our study there with the Brandenburg Gate. In another sub-theme that moves through this is the reflection on reforming the activity of the theater and the, the absolute centrality of the theater to German intellectual life and social life during this period. Of course, this is a period when the modern Germany does not yet exist. It exists only with the idea of what is often referred to as Kultur Nation Deutschland or cultural nation of Germany, with the idea that Germany is a cultural zone despite the fact that it is still a fragmented landscape of the remnants of the breakup of the Holy Roman Empire with everything from small bishoprics or uh, dukedoms to major emerging states that are beginning to uh, give a run for their money even to the United Kingdom and to France, such as Prussia and Bavaria, and of course, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, equally in part German speaking. The one thing that brought everyone together was language. And from the 1780s, we find the creations of national theaters across the German principalities and states. These uh, refer not to the idea of a German nation that doesn't exist, but a place where plays are performed in German, a kind of cultural zone of, of being brought together through a uh, culture. So I'm just juxtaposing here two stage designs by one of Gili on the left and Schinkel on the right. The one on the right will actually have been executed. Gili's in a drawing, Schinkel's in a engraving from his uh, great uh, collection of his own architectural uh, designs, but both of them projecting some ideals of their architectural aspirations to form an architecture which would also form Prussian identity and form a citizenry, a kind of, we might say, a crafting of spectator, not only in the interior zone of the theater, but the city and by extension, even the country as a stage uh, for more and more uh, actors. Um, you see in particular, the shift here from the vision of antiquity uh, with almost this Greek chorus singing on stage below a figure of the monarch uh, being staged in some unnamed uh, classical play. And on the right, here we are about 25 years later, 1819, um, with uh, Schinkel in his rebuilding of the so-called um, Schauspielhaus or uh, a theater on the Gendarmenplatz. We'll get to that. That's the building we see on stage in this stage design, uh, he imagining a view of a play that will take place against the most contemporary scene, in fact, the scene of the city itself. So spectatorship, representation, not only representation of the monarch, but a representation that was really shared with many others. Athens on the spray, this classical culture. This too was a project that transcended Prussia. It was one that was embraced by many uh, parts of Kultur or cultural uh, nation uh, Germany. One of the key figures was someone who wrote in German, but who had by the time his influential first publication appeared, moved for the rest of his life to Rome. This was the uh, proto-art historian, uh, esthetician, 
a theorist of style and of the relationship of artistic and architectural style to the formation of ethics, morality, self-consciousness, Johann Joachim Winkelmann in his highly influential, although only published in a very small number of copies, publication of 1755, published as he was migrating from a position in the Saxon court at Dresden to become the court librarian to the Cardinal Albani at the Villa Albani in Rome, wrote this famous reflections on the imitation of Greek works in painting and sculpture. He would later go on also to explore Greek and Roman architecture in situ, never traveling in fact to Greece, but he did travel to Pestum on the south coast uh, of Italy, south, about 100 miles or so south of Naples. Uh, but I think from the very first sentence of this first publication, his motto was clear. He said, the only way for us, in other words, for we moderns, the only way for us to be great is through the imitation of the ancients. This established, uh, particularly through the imitation of the Greeks. The Greeks, he thought, had a superior social and political system, a superior climate, a superior culture, and along with that came all of the manifestations of the visual arts, painting and sculpture, and of course, the architecture that remained of the um, ancient uh, temples, theaters, and the like, which for him were the highest standards to which any society could aspire. This took up residence quite literally in one of the first people that Frederick William III called to Prussia in a complete rebuilding of the, we might call the architectural culture of the Prussian capital uh, around his own monarchy and his own state project, but also around a series of institutions, the existing Academy of the Fine Arts, uh, and then along with it, helping to sponsor the separate creation of an architectural school, the Building Academy, the Bau Academy, the School of Architecture, the buildings of which we saw in one of the first slides. A whole group of antiquarians, an antiquarian in the 18th century was a person who studied antiquities. They called themselves as well archeologists. You can see that here, a court advisor, Alois Hirt, is a professor of archeology. span Archeology span in this sense is not the modern sense of digging to understand the strata of ancient society, but rather one who is a specialist in the remaining uh, remnants of antiquity. Uh, the sculpture, and in particular, in our case, the architecture. He and others, like the architect, archaeologist, antiquarian Hans Christian Ginelli, uh, in his book on the theaters of Athens, uh, and a whole series of publications, so that Berlin became something of a center from the very closing years of the 1780s on for the study of classical antiquity. Soon this would also extend belatedly since Saxony had been much ahead in this, and Bavaria as well, to the belated uh, formation of a great collection of uh, ancient, ancient works. Beginning, of course, with um, casts and the like for the students in the academy schools, but soon in the conception that a modern state would also need a museum open to the public. Now, uh, in some ways, of uh, some pathos in speaking of museums open to the public, as we all await the reopening of our great museums in New York, apparently the 31st of August at the Met. Not all of the literature was uh, retrospectively looking at this idea that one must imitate the ancients in order to have any aspirations to greatness and modernity. There were also uh, treatises and collections of essays and even the first sustained architectural periodical, you see it here, the collection of essays and texts that uh, concern architecture, staged by Gilles' father, David Gilles, who we'll meet in a moment. Uh, these are some of his other publications, many of which dealt with land management, uh, with hyd what we would probably call the engineering of hydrology, dams, bridges, water courses, uh, the administration of land, uh, as well as new construction techniques. This one is, in fact, a pamphlet on the construction of a particular vaulted roof uh, form. So land management, what is here called land architecture, uh, not simply uh, for ornamental purposes, but also for economic and agricultural um, purposes as well. And what would be more appropriate since by 1800, uh, Prussia had extended its territory, especially towards the east, taking in much of what is today uh, modern day uh, Poland, 
uh, even into uh, Russia. You'll remember that Kaliningrad, the Russian city that it's nearly impossible to visit today, was Königsberg, originally the site of the most important university in the um, Prussian lands. Uh, so all of these provinces that made up Prussia, plus various properties uh, uh, that were held uh, remotely as Prussia began to expand its territory, not only contiguously, but even in a certain sense, placing stakes for its hope to ultimately be the state that would rule a united German speaking uh, Europe, uh, the first time that rears its head, if you will. So Berlin was actually relatively uh, eccentrically to the West in the territory that it um, controlled. I'm bringing this up now because in the year 1787, about to 1791, many of the leading figures who are out administering the Prussian state project in the provinces will be called to Berlin to create a generation of extraordinary questioning, intelligence, talent, who will in turn create the Berlin Bau Academy and make it into one of the training grounds for one of the most coherent and inventive architecture schools in the closing moments of the European 18th century. So Berlin would be changed from uh, a city largely of wooden buildings, Fachwerk houses, timber construction, into a city where uh, stone and monumental representation were not simply for the palace. Here's the palace, we'll be coming back to it, the Schloss or the city palace of the Hohenzollern monarchs, its side elevation, and the appearance uh, over the course of our period of numerous monuments to the monarchy. So the public sphere would be um, shared with the search for royal representation. So the first of these figures, we have to introduce a few before we get to our duo of Gili and Schinkel, is Karl Gotthard Langhans, uh, the architect who we've already um, encountered, whose most famous work, but by no means his largest, or in some ways most important, but certainly his most symbolic, was the Brandenburg uh, Gate. He had been called um, from a Breslau, what is today Roszlov, in uh, Poland, uh, where he had been very active working in Prussian uh, Silesia. Silesia, in fact, uh, conquered in the mid 18th century. Silesia, largely uh, Catholic, it was the reason that there was a Catholic cathedral, St. Hedwig, on Unterdain Linden to celebrate as well as to placate the new Silesian subjects of the Prussians. But Langhans's work began as both a, a court architect, a private architect, and a certain sense by extension of the court, a public architect for the Prussian state in Silesia. There he was working first for the Count Hatzfeld, whose palace you see on the left, just to give you a sense of his architecture, becoming much more severe in what is going to be characteristic of the 1790s, this search for an elementarist geometry unlay, underlying the quest for form. A abandonment of the archeological reproduction of classical architecture and its search in a, in a way to undergird it with a elementarist, almost platonic um, sense of form, very rigorously um, composed and expressed. As for instance, in this outbuilding, the princely pheasantry at Pless uh, for the Hatzfelds. Uh, but the work would also include uh, a building that was long forgotten, but has recently been splendidly restored. One of the first freestanding uh, synagogues uh, built in the Prussian lands in the 18th century, the White Stork Synagogue in Breslau, Hoshloff of 1781, here in a recent photograph, here photograph that I took when I first saw it right after the um, fall of the Berlin Wall and its interior. And then I thought just to juxtapose to show you this radical transformation of the idea of classicism in Berlin in the years after 1789. Here is the Brandenburg Gate at Potsdam, built in 1770 by the architect Georg Ungers, uh, very much archeologically informed to be sure, but with a kind of Baroque sense of form, of movement and decoration. And then this absolute placing of the insignia of the Athenian propyleum, replacing the Roman triumphal arch. So not only a move from Rome to Greece, from Rome to Athens, here as we move closer to the spray, but also 
a much more rigorous classicism, go on the Baroque double columns and movement of that in favor of this search for underlying geometries, even in the handling of the way the buildup takes place to the figure of the Quadriga facing down Unter den Linden to the view to the main palace. Uh, there we have it, um, the inspiration. This is the rather fanciful um, French correction of the asymmetries of the actual propyleum of the Acropolis from the um, book on the most beautiful monuments of Greece by David Le Roy, uh, published in France in 1758, which there were multiple copies in the libraries of Berlin architects. And here is its interpretation, minus pediment by uh, Karl uh, Gotthard uh, Langhans, who says, uh, in order to give the gate as many openings as possible, I have built it, the gate through the whole, the wall, on the model of the city gate of Athens. I've taken that over as my model. So this combination of the idea of as many openings as possible, a kind of democratization and opening up, not to everyone, of course, but to a larger social class, a kind of sharing with the upper middle class, with, of course, the Prussian aristocracy of the shaping of the city of Berlin. Just this uh, surviving construction drawing to show you also that despite the fact that it appears as a post and lintel building, it is in fact a series of flat arches with a lot of interesting Prussian engineering behind it. Langhans would already emerge as a theater architect and almost all of the great figures who will be involved with tonight would move between the theory of how one stages a city, a scene, a play on stage and how one stages a building in urban space and how urban space in turn becomes the stage not only for a beautified city, our harmonious city in Athens on the Spree, but also for new social possibilities. So this is Langhans in Potsdam, a building long lost. And this is the new theater that he built in the center of Berlin on the Gendarmenmark in 1800, which only survived for 19 years or so before it went up in flame to be replaced by Schinkel. One of his most spectacular buildings, little known, but recently restored and survived the Second World War uh, and was open, if not well cared for in the German Democratic Republic, is this wonderful anatomical theater, part of the School of Medicine and the great hospital complex of the Charité uh, in the center of Berlin. David Gili began his career in Pomerania, also to the east, uh, where he was involved not only in providing public buildings that might be needed in administering towns, but working uh, in the in the marshlands that uh, occupy much of eastern Prussia, uh, water courses, bridges, dams, uh, hydraulic uh, engineering, so a notion of architecture that included much of what in other countries might be thought of as the realm of engineering, civic architecture, uh, the civic realm, land management, even. Uh, I think you see him as a, a somewhat staid figure of state, uh, the engineer architect. And then his son, uh, very short-lived, he would only live till 28 before he died of consumption, a romantic disease. But I think you can see also in the portrait that by the early 1790s, he had fallen in with emerging German literary romanticism. In fact, he was to be celebrated already before he died by those two great poets and playwrights, Wackenroder and Tieck, as a genius. So the cult of genius now extending to the architect, uh, one of the first architects in modernity to literally be celebrated as a, uh, a genius uh, and to be seen as a talent cut short, but one of the founding generation of the modern Berlin school of classicism, or what we would say neoclassicism. So this is some of Debbie Gili's work, some of it very austere uh, and, um, and geometric for farm work and moving up a hierarchy as one moved uh, up the um, ladder of building types. And another figure who ought to come in here and who has been very much overshadowed by the celebration beginning with his death in 1800 of Friedrich Gili uh, is his brother-in-law, you see what a tight-knit group of people we're dealing with, Heinrich Gens, a brilliant architect who only in the last few years has finally had a book dedicated to him. He was the architect of this building which mystified many in the 1790s when it was finished. Many questioned 
Is it Neo-Egyptian in its battered back walls? Is it Neo-Greek Doric with this baseless Doric that showed knowledge of Pestum and other early Greek temple types? Uh, what was one to make of the window forms on the third floor, which housed the Bow Academy? This was the Mint. This was the Academy of Mineralogy. And this was the Academy of Building, which was simultaneously the place to train young architects, but also the place to administer all of the buildings that came under the state budget or the separate office for royal buildings. So these are state buildings that were administered here. So this combination of state architectural administration and building school was also characteristic of the emerging Berlin School of Athens on the Spree. One of the most interesting things that has come up, up, up recently as people have begun to study the emergence of fashion literature and early uh, aesthetic literature, literary criticism in the wake of the publication of Kant's uh, Critique of Judgment, uh, a huge debate that took place over what style was this building, as I began to suggest. And Gens answered by saying, if people are debating it, that's fine with me. That's the purpose. I think that architecture should be something that instigates public debate and public engagement. And also, if they can't pinhole it or pigeonhole it into a particular historical style, that too represents the fact that our architectural engagement with classical antiquity can also lead to invention, to modern creation, and to the, in, to the crafting of a distinct Berlin school that is not a slave to the literal imitation of archaeological finds. This is a, a, a last building I'll show you by David Gili. This is the Fieweg House in uh, Braunschweig in Brunswick. Uh, but equally interesting is the emergence of an interest in medieval architecture and medieval construction. And even in the case here of David Gili in a sports hall a, and school, a gymnasium built but didn't last very long in Berlin, of the application of medieval technology to new wooden forms of vaulting for the creation of communal spaces. Also the land surveying that took him back into Silesia and to the Marienburg, which is today in Poland, where the young David Gili drew the medieval architecture of this ruined uh, monastery in Prussian brick Gothic, but began to refer to it for the first time as our Vaterländische Architektur, or the architecture of our fatherland. So the beginning of the association of a competing style, the Gothic, as somehow a, a patriotic style. We're going to see where that goes. Healy left in 1795 for a short trip. He couldn't travel to, um, to Italy, uh, but he traveled instead to Paris, where he witnessed 1797, sorry, I think I said 1795, 1797, where he witnessed the incredible vibrant building culture with the stabilization of the uh, French revolutionary government after the terror. Uh, particularly the emergence of new public theaters and along with them urbanism. This is the, um, we saw this, if any of you listened to my lecture on the revolution, the Théâtre Fédo and the accompanying Rue des Colonnes. He also, here's the Rue des Colonnes. He saw these new building, these new abstract buildings of uh, apartment houses. He was interested in all sorts of details, staircases, big open public spaces, the meeting hall of the um, legislator, the Council of the 500, and he bore witness to one of the festivals of unity on one of the revolutionary festivals. So these are all sketches from his Parisian uh, sketchbook. Back he comes to, um, to Berlin at just the point when there is going to be a competition for the transformation of this square right here, the Leipziger Platz and the little Potsdamer Platz attached to it, Leipziger Platz just inside the wall, Potsdamer Platz just outside. The idea was very politically motivated to celebrate the memory of Frederick the Great, this forefather of Frederick William III, much beloved. The idea in a certain sense to channel this admiration for Frederick the Great, not only to the political purposes of Frederick William, but also hopefully to foster an idea of a tradition of a caring monarchy against the recent regicide on the other side of the Rhine in France. Here are some of the proposals that we've put forth, the one on the left by Longhans, a kind of ionic tempietto with the figure of Frederick the Great to be placed, he proposed in the middle of the square to be planted and others, very sculptural. But the one that um, 
captured almost everybody's imagination when it was exhibited with the other competition entries at the annual exhibition the following year was this one uh, in this panoramic landscape by the young Friedrich Gili, David Gili's son. Here he imagined not simply to create an image of a modernized Athenian Acropolis uh, built up on this artificial mound with the uh, Greek temple emerging as a kind of image almost of, of perfection against the sky, but it would be also an observation point for looking at all of Berlin, a place where the average citizen could come up and see inside the temple cella, a statue of Frederick the Great, but also witness the ongoing transformation of the Prussian capital uh, with projects for theaters and other new buildings that Frederick William III hoped to initiate and a rebuilding of the entrance gate, a kind of elementarist, robust uh, uh, interpretation of the Brandenburg Gate. So imagine if this gate, instead, uh, not even a decade after the Brandenburg Gate, where Prussian classicism is going, from its archaeological roots towards this elementarist expression of the juxtaposition of volumes with columnar episodes of great openness. Uh, here's the surviving sketch. I bring it in in particular because you can see from the beginning, it's an urbanistic scheme with also the construction in this flat landscape of an artificial viewing platform, almost a panoramic uh, positioning point in the city. Here's some details to take you in uh, there. And the last project we'll look for was a project when there was equally a discussion of how to build a national theater, Berlin version of a national theater for the performance of both ancient texts and modern German plays uh, in a place where a large part of the um, literate populace could come together. Gili proposed to rethink the classical Greek theater uh, for, uh, with a kind of Roman valerium above it uh, in this incredibly um, platonic solid composition of radical juxtapositions of forms and baseless, heroic baseless pestum columns uh, as the centerpiece of a public square set between two existing churches of the early 18th century. And he even began to imagine what kinds of stage sets might take place on a reformed theater set, corresponding new ideas about how to perform a play, how to stage a play that had been expressed by none other than Wolfgang Goethe. Uh, ultimately, this much more conservative design by the older Langhans was chosen and um, much to the disappointment of Gili and the, those who followed him, including the young Schinkel, in a private academy that Gili had uh, created in order to meet about once a week with a group of seven, the number was modeled on the members of Plato's Academy, who would discuss the relationship between literature and architecture, the capacity of architecture not only to be erudite constructive science, erudite archeological knowledge, but also to be a medium for evoking emotions of both a private and communal sort. There's the building as built. Uh, some of the last and most radical designs of Gili, I think given the hour, I must hurry up and leave so I can leave at least 20, 25 minutes for Schinkel's protean career. Schinkel, in fact, was to emerge right out of the office, if you will, the architectural practice of the young Friedrich Gili. In fact, in Gili's final years, uh, right before 1800, the very young Schinkel was lodging with the Gili family. So he was a kind of adopted son and pupil, and he took over the buildings that you can see here, particularly the Steinmeier House, long demolished, but was a, one of the great urban houses in uh, Berlin. It was a project begun by Gili and finished by Schinkel. So this is a kind of Louis Sullivan to Frank Lloyd Wright in 1790s Berlin, where um, Gili's projects drawn up by Gili would be completed in both drawing form and then supervised in building by the young Schinkel. So he literally emerges in every way from the Gili household. And I forgot to tell you that at 16 years of age, when he was thinking that he might pursue a career in music, he was throughout his life interested in the relationship between music, both ancient and modern, to architecture. The teenage uh, Schinkel saw Gilles proposal for the Frederick the Great Monument, this modernized Acropolis at the exhibition and decided he claimed later, and his first biographer repeated, 
almost as a conversion experience that he wanted to become an architect and to become a follower of Gili. Before he would build anything much of his own, most of his early projects, except for a few outbuildings at um, aristocratic estates were finishing up Gili's project, Schinko left on a trip of formation, what the romantic poets would call a Bildungsreise or cultivation uh, journey um, to Italy. This was a moment in, of a gap in the revolutionary wars. It was possible to travel uh, again and Schinkel will travel between 1803 and 1805, an extended trip to Italy that will take him all the way to Sicily uh, and then on to, uh, on to Paris. What is interesting from the beginning are two things that are reflected here. This is in Vienna on the way. This is traveling down uh, the Elba uh, here near Dresden. One is his fascination with lenses and viewing devices as ways to capture uh, panoramic and extensive comprehensive views in which building nature and larger topography, even weather phenomena are all brought into a relationship with one another. Here, very much the emerging romantic view of a kind of organic relationship between nature and human construction. And the other is an appreciation for a wide range of architectural styles. In fact, he communicated to a publisher that he hoped to look at the neglected buildings of Italy once he got there. He wanted to know about medieval architecture and its relationship to the land. He wanted to know about the vernacular buildings. Of course, he wanted to publish a book and make his name with the travel book, which would, since at least the 1750s had been a way of grabbing uh, patrons, attention, prestige, and credentials. But over and over again, we find, and he left a diary that we can still read uh, on his uh, trip to, um, to Italy, probably very much inspired by Goethe's publication of his trip to Italy, carrying some guidebooks with him. But before he arrived anywhere, he often would climb to the highest point, whether it was a mountaintop or a church tower, to get a sense of the overall lay of the land and to understand buildings in relationship to their larger context. So here he is arriving in Trieste, and we find this over and over again. And here are just some examples of uh, his interest in drawing uh, what he called Saracenic architecture, interested in the stylistic mix that gave rise to Italian Romanesque from influences throughout the Mediterranean. So at the same time as he is formed in this uh, post-Winkelmannian notion of the purity of Greek culture, and it will stay with him, we'll see it returning in full force after 1815 when he's able to build, he also had explored a whole chain of historical connections, interested not only in the diversity of style, but in the historical forces that led to change itself and to stylistic evolution. Here's some of his Roman drawings, the view from his window. This becomes a characteristic form where Schinkel is interested in the relationship between an interior or a position where my body and my eye is and a distant view often collapsed pictorially uh, by the absence of the middle ground. You're going to see that over and over again. I'll give an entire lecture, if you like, on precisely that phenomena and what it means for some of the philosophical texts that Schinkel is reading in these years about how humans have consciousness in relationship to the environment and how even their consciousness of themselves is formed. Complex subject, but one that Schinkel was grappling with as he carried on his trip with him a few books in his backpack, if you will, that were guides to uh, existing portable guides to what he was going to see, but also a copy of the philosopher Fichte's a book on how to obtain self-consciousness. Um, interested in geology, geological formation, but equally interested in vernacular architecture and the relationship between the two. Almost a sense that in particular in vernacular architecture, mankind was continuing what he would call the constructive nature of architecture, of uh, the constructive nature of nature itself. So geology as a kind of natural architecture and vernacular architecture as a, um, uh, an almost unmediated continuation of that. So this paying attention, let's say to the temples here at Segesta on Sicily uh, to high style architecture, but also to ageless vernacular architecture, be it a medieval citadel or a farmhouse set of stairs. Here's one of my favorites of him. He's interested in how this building adjusts to its topography. And where we really see it is in this drawing that he drew. It's a big mystery. There have been many studies on it. It's 
believed that there was actually someone he met, uh, an Englishman on his trip, who said, could you design for me a house if I were able to uh, move to, uh, to Sicily? Maybe you wanted to get away from the period equivalent of Boris Johnson, have a um, estate there. And Schinkel imagines a building that would take advantage of everything he was experiencing from the vernacular farmhouse to classical ordering of both architecture and outdoor spaces to the temporary suspension of drapery uh, in the Rome that uh, archaeologists were saying was part of Roman architecture, uh, an essay on the organic relationship of architecture to topography and to site, but also on the birth and evolution of uh, what we might call tectonic form. By the time Schinkel returned to uh, Berlin, uh, the Napoleonic Wars were raging again. He'd had a short stay in Paris. It would no longer be possible to travel, but it would also be, there would be no building commissions whatsoever. He turned instead to a whole series of visual art practices, which became laboratories in the end for future architecture. One was the production of um, landscape paintings, often imagining antique architecture in relationship to antique life and the landscape. The other were stage sets for this theater, which he, as a true um, mentee of, uh, of Gili, regretted very much had not been built on new principles. He hoped that the very least the practice of stage design and the depth and relationship of the stage to the action could be changed. Uh, he wanted to be named the architect of the uh, theatrical performances, and he began to produce a whole series of uh, stage designs, ultimately acti uh, many of them actually uh, executed, and exploring there the relationship between exotic settings here in Egyptian uh, performance and the uh, operas that would um, take place there. Through a Prussian entrepreneur, two brothers, the Gropius brothers, these are the ancestors of Walter Gropius, the founder of the Bauhaus, um, Carl and Wilhelm Gropius, uh, Schinkel began to create a series of popular entertainments, dioramas often shown for Christmas displays, uh, and panoramas. The, the uh, Gropius brothers built a panorama modeled on the one that had been invented by Robert Fulton, uh, one that had been, uh, Schinkel had seen in, in Paris. Uh, the panoramas were becoming the kind of fad of European um, cities. This is one, this is not one by Schinkel, but this is just to show how they work. These 360 degree paintings where a viewing platform with an absent middle ground and a collapsing distance 360 kind of sense around all came together. Amazingly, some of the most popular were, this one was from London, double panorama, kind of multiplex, if you will. You could go up a second set of steps and arrive in this smaller panorama where you could look at London. Here you were in London, going in a panorama on Leicester Square, looking at London inside. So the ability to uh, comprehend and survey the complex form of the growing modern city in one view was something that Schinkel wanted to share. This is the only surviving image we have of one of the panoramas he created. It's a panorama of his memory of having been in Palermo. Uh, Schinkel also uh, talked about his relationship to the landscape, and here he depicts himself ascending Mount Etna in order to take in what he called the Schauspiel, or the play, the drama of sunrise, uh, and seeing all of the topography of the Mediterranean to Calabria from the coast of Sicily. But he said at this moment, having just finished reading his Fichte on how to achieve a higher state of self-consciousness, that in this position he felt himself much larger than himself. In other words, he felt himself as though he could comprehend things that were beyond uh, daily experience or daily vision. And in some ways, this has been suggested in my own book and more recently in a very stimulating book by Kurt Foster on Schinkel, this project of how to translate that personal experience into one of the civic nature was one of the elements of Schinkel's vocation after 1815 with the final defeat of Napoleon when it became possible to build again, that he hoped to translate into architecture for the, the country. Also, some of these dioramas were current events. People loved to see the burning of Moscow and the defeat of Napoleon there. He began to explore in his own private group, the, uh, this title alone, it says it all, an attempt to express the yearning beauty of the melancholy which fills the heart as the sounds of holy worship ring forth from a church. 
Schinkel involved in an architecture that could uh, move between music, literature, and landscape, but also that could evoke specific emotions. In the context of what the Germans refer to as the Wars of Liberation between 1813 and 1815, the successive um, battles that finally led to the defeat of Napoleon and the chasing of the French uh, revolutionary, increasingly imperial army, uh, um, armies from the German lands, Schinkel began to create images that were meant to inspire patriotic feelings, to bring citizens together in the war effort. And interestingly, it was the image of the social unity and the architectural unity of the ideal medieval town as a kind of perfect society with the idea based in literature and in particular the ideas of Goethe on, on Gothic architecture, that the medieval cathedral was a communal project that had been built not only by a designing architect, but by all elements of society, literally contributing to its total work of art. And this Schinkel proposed uh, in a project for the very place where his inspiration, Friedrich Gili here on this Leipziger Platz had proposed to build the Frederick the Great monument, never built, the statue would ultimately be placed up here. Schinkel proposed in the heart of the wars of liberation against Napoleon to build a national cathedral of Prussian brick, of Prussian Gothic style, with a kind of a huge plaza in front, a kind of cross between an ancient forum and the space of, in front of say Pisa Cathedral or Milan Cathedral. Uh, but one where he hoped not only the national style would be brought together, what Gili had all already called the patriotic style, but that literally this brick building would be built by every citizen carrying a single brick to the construction site. So Prussia was going to rebuild itself. The reconstruction of the country was going to literally be an architectural act. At the same time, in the war effort, Prussians had been asked to bring their jewelry to have it melted down for arms, saying that I gave my gold in order to finance the creation of iron, gold gave it for Eisen, uh, and Schinkel began to um, capitalize on this casting of cast iron as a patriotic material of the war effort. And the Iron Cross, created as the highest military honor, but associated now with medieval form in these memorials to the defeats of Napoleon, in front of parish churches near the battle sites of the Wars of Liberation, finally taking the form of the Great Kreuzberg Monument, one of the earliest works of monumental cast iron in European architecture, set on the Kreuzberg, the highest mountain, the cavalry mountain uh, to the south of Berlin and providing a panoramic viewpoint over a city that was in the process of being transformed by Schinkel's works. So let us take the concluding 10, 15 minutes that I can work with you to really bring that Athens on the spray fully into view. Schinkel is going to make seemingly a radical shift, although for his whole life, he's going to be interested in the coexistence of styles, a shift back to the archeological antiquarian project of spray on the Athens, of Greek culture as the highest form of expression, of the kind of highest aesthetic experience, but also the highest vision of aesthetics in service of a state that will now embrace uh, a citizenry that has fought against Napoleon, exhausted but eager to uh, rebuild. This is also the moment when all of the artworks that had been taken from the royal palaces of the Hohenzollern by Napoleon to Paris to put them on display as uh, aesthetic war booty in the newly created Louvre would be returned to Berlin. So it's a time when everyone is thinking of the um, cultural and artistic artifacts that are part of the recreation of civic life in post-war Berlin, not post-1945 here, but post-1815. Schinkel paints a painting for the um, royal uh, couple that are, uh, had just been married, the uh, future king, King Frederick William IV, uh, and um, offers it to him as a wedding gift. And this is called a, a view into the high point of Grecian civilization. And there we see the, uh, a kind of Greek temple above the city being built with the theatrical column there, a kind of shift from this imagery of the medieval perfect organic society back to another. But these two poles of the Germanic medieval and the 
Grecian moment of cultural building will come together in his vision for Berlin. Now coming back to an Unter den Linden, uh, which he sees as Baroque and old fashioned, new projects will emerge. The first will be to replace this little guard house for a newly created civic guard where citizens will patrol their city. The former soldiers will now become, uh, in a sense, those who will bring civic order and peace to the realm. And Schinkel is to design a, a, a guard house for them. But this guardhouse will not only be a place where they can sleep, it will be a place where the changing of guard will take place uh, as a, um, a kind of staged theater twice a day in the heart of Royal Berlin. He doesn't know at first what style to take. There are countless sketches for different variants, some of them seemingly Egyptian meets Romanesque, some of them more purely Ptolemaic Egyptian. The site is next to the arsenal, the seat of the, mar of the um, military, but on the other side is the building that has been given over to the Berlin University, which has been moved from Konigsberg. There's a little woods there that's to be kept, and at first he thinks to place the building deep, deep in the woods, but ultimately he moves it almost to the front of the site, leaving just enough space for a theatrical performance before this building, which is at once a monument and a backdrop, stage drop for the changing of the guard in the importation of a perfect Greek a uh, temple front, kind of piece of the uh, Parthenon, if you will, juxtaposed in front of a Roman castrum, uh, a fortification. So this combination of transparency and protection. Uh, interestingly, we'll see in a moment, here is the building uh, photographed about 20 years ago, very long and checkered history. These are photographs of it in the early 20th century. This gives you those sense of how it might serve as a backdrop placed originally between four statues of, um, of generals. So a celebration also of the Prussian um, victory, um, survival even, of the Napoleonic invasion, uh, creating a secondary cross axis on Unter den Linden. Interestingly enough, although these were perfectly uh, carved and constructed Greek Doric columns, baseless for this military and civic function, these are actually cast zinc monuments that are the first announcement of Schinkel's belief that a standardized architectural ornament could be industrially produced and could show the increased industrialization, craft and refinement of Prussian industries. So the refinement not only of individual civic buildings, but the whole project of state uh, industries, arts and crafts, as he would call it, came together in this building. It's a, a sense of how it tries, you don't even see it here, but once you come up to it, it actually creates a little square and a stage set on the progression down Unter den Linden to the Great Palace, just being finished in its um, simulacrum for Hilton hotels and museums at the moment. I don't think it's actually Hilton. Uh, here's the procession down, there's the Neue Vaca, uh, and the bridge that would be reconstructed by Schinkel, another view of how that worked. And this sense that this little building by its placement could hold its own against Frederick the Great's great accomplishment, the um, classical opera across the, the street. Now I want to take you to two other places. Schinkel, who was so disappointed by Long Hans's building, he always would have preferred to see his mentor Gili's building there, uh, must have been overjoyed when he learned that the building was in flame and couldn't be saved in 1819. We're going to look at his creation of a theater there. And then it will end with quickly with two buildings, his creation of the Altus Museum, now beautifully restored and part of this extended rethinking of what's called the Museum Island, but the story begins with Schinkel, Museum Island just completed by David Chipperfield. And um, when you can travel again, if you haven't been there, you must. And then we will look down here at the creation right in here of the Building Academy, Schinkel's last great work in Berlin. Here is the building that burns, and here's Schinkel's building that replaces it. The columns could be saved, and Schinkel is required to reuse them, but he lifts them up on a pedestal. He loves placing things up where you get a viewing platform. He creates a stair that we will ascend to the condition of culture, if you will, from the prototypes for, say, the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, stair, this idea that museums, theaters, buildings of, uh, of culture 
are temples to which one ascends, but it also practically allows for those with the more expensive seats to come in with their carriage and slip in in a private entrance below to meet then in the uh, auditorium. As much as this expresses a purity of classical architecture, here he is willing to take those forms and reconceive them as a rationalized skin that wraps around the complex sets of, uh, uh, of plans within these two wings, which are in fact not at all symmetrical, either in use or in the types of spaces contained, but the creation of a unified image uh, through this uh, system, which some have seen as a prototype for even American skyscraper construction, this systematized screen of a stripped down, rationalized um, classical tectonic. See it? Kind of super order and then the superimposition within of a smaller order, sometimes left blank, but uh, unifying the whole into uh, an exquisite system, at once classical, rethought, rationalized, and in his mind, modern. Uh, the first time I was able finally to visit it in the 1980s, uh, when it was still East Germany, I was astounded at how steep this chair, this stair was, and astounded by the fact that once you got onto the portico, the stair disappears from view, and one is in fact looking out over, you see the stair gone, over a panorama of Berlin. So we get a viewing platform out to the city before we go into and discover that we're not only sitting amongst all our, uh, our co-citizens, but in fact the opening night in a new prologue to the play Iphigenia and Taurus, the prologue written by Goethe for the opening of this Schinkel building, the actor comes on stage and says, the whole of our society must be assembled here. So there's a kind of reciprocal reference. Here you all are. You, I'm on stage, but you are also on stage, but you are looking back at what he's steadied in front of, this view, the royal view of Schinkel's theater, repositioning Gendarmenmarkt this square between the French and the German cathedrals as a transformation of a new stage set uh, for the theater as an assembly point for cultural interaction in Berlin. You can see I stole this photograph to show you what it looks like. We must now, in conclusion, go to two places, the Building Academy here, this is obviously a post-World War II photograph with Schinkel's Friedrich Werdische Church and his museum there. So this laying out, there's the, um, the guardhouse. He can't impose an overall um, transformation of the city, but he does it by the progressive insertion of one monument after the other. Look at the dialogue between this one and this one, fascinating, across this branch of the spray. But this, this is uh, about 1946. This is a photograph from the end of the 19th century. The cathedral's rebuilt post Schinkel, but it shows this stand, this confrontation between the great facade of the palace where the art collections had been, and the art collections having been returned from Paris need to be rehoused, and Schinkel imagines them being placed in a building that not only is going to make them publicly accessible in a new building type that hardly, this is really the second or third uh, attempt to create the completely new building of a public freestanding um, um, museum, but he says that he wants to create not only a housing for the museum, but that the museum itself should be a kind of picture on this outdoor gallery in which the four powers of the modern Prussian state come together. The crown, over here the army, we don't see the arsenal, the church, and now public culture, the uh, museum. There's the Schauspielhaus, and now we're going to go down Unter den Linden. Here we have a problem, the bridge goes to the palace. Schinkel wants to change this situation, and through a landscape and planting technique, he creates at this moment views that will show off the series of monuments. A cut view to the church, you see it here, a view to the palace, corner of the arsenal, and this extraordinary adaptation of the stoa, the great secular market form in the agora, rather than the acropolis of ancient Athens, as the image of the uh, modern museum. And here, in this wonderful view of the Schinkel family and Humboldt and various others, on the roof of his uh, brick neo-Gothic church, he asks the painter to leave this pinnacle in um, restoration so that the view is opened up to his transformation of stoa plus pantheon dome into 
a, a modern museum. His rebuilding of the portico of the cathedral to really stage set this entire situation. And there is his incredible garden plan. So over and over, a building, as much as it appears to be a perfect composition in and of itself, is also part of a larger uh, environment. And as we move in, he creates a journey that will take us up a staircase there, originally painted with the elaborate fresco series on the origins of art as the expression of the human perfection, not only a search not only for perfection, but for community, for representation of both individual and collective, a lesson in the meaning, the origins and the meaning of art before one goes in to contemplate works of art itself. Here's one study for the invention of drawing uh, there. These would, so therefore, this would have all been figurative art. We pass through two screens of, um, uh, of ionic columns uh, in a past a, and through the um, stoa, or kind of propyleum, and then under the first stair, and we're going to ascend up to a platform here, or go straight through to a rotunda with the finest works of art there. This journey is extraordinary. It's going to take us almost up through Gili's very elementarist architecture. We're almost going to recapitulate the birth and progress of architecture itself to come up to this platform. Unfortunately for a Rembrandt show, I think in the late 70s, the East Germans filled this in with glass. So today it's not quite as transparent as it uh, once was, but the staircase has been since about 1992, open again so that we can ascend as Schinkel imagined and look out over, here's, photographs from the 1930s uh, and look out as this father and son, he's teaching his son how to understand art. These are two friends, they're discussing art in what the German romantics like to call an art conversation or Kunstkonversation, which was a conversation between two friends whose conversation was elevated to a higher level because the third uh, party, if you will, in their conversation were works of art. But for Schinkel, works of art here are not simply what's on display in the museum or what's been created as part of its didactic decorative program, but the city itself. In this frame view where the palace and his newly defined church and ultimately his own school of architecture would enter into a panorama, a kind of glimpse into the heyday or the flourishing of Berlin as a counterpoint to the painting that he'd given the crown prince on his wedding the, the view into Athens greatness. Here it is rendered by a contemporary painter of the views that are framed through that. And then our journey could take us into what he called the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary of the greatest works of art, taken of course from the Vatican museums, but brought into this combination of the ideal museum as postulated by the French theorist Durand just a few years earlier, the Roman pantheon, as the seat of all the, of all the gods in the cosmos, but that aspiration to enter into a perfected space from a panoramic viewing platform that repositioned the relationship between the ideal and the given city, the modern city, between the past and the present, between the ideal and reality in this great museum. The last thing to be added to here is Schinkel's architecture school. How Gili and Schinkel and the others around them had elevated architecture to such a position that in the panoramic landscape of the palace, the church, the cathedral, the uh, head of the arsenal for the Prussian military state, particularly re-triumphant after the defeat of Napoleon, that architecture, the administration of architecture and the teaching of architecture should become a building block of that monumental uh, landscape. Unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this fascinating group of buildings long gone. This is today where the museum expansions are. David Chipperfield's building is right there today. But let's look at this building school, which he imagines being seen first in this angular perspectival view reflected in this branch of the spray. What is that building? It doesn't look like anything one could find in ancient Athens. There we see it from the nearby Friedrich Werdische church that Schinkel had also built in a Prussian Gothic style in the 1820s. By the 1830s, his last great building where he, in fact, will occupy this corner apartment. And this will be the building school below it, the building administration, uh, a building of utilitarian red brick, but glazed in the most beautiful terracotta uh, elements of his 
friend, the Prussian uh, manufacturer, Feilner. So again, Prussian arts and crafts brought together with the tempering of regular symmetry of construction. It is actually proto skyscraper because each of these is on a floating uh, foundation, independent one from another, building fascinating in its construction innovations, but one that wants to take the synthesis of classical rhythm and form and the, the national Gothic and to bring it into the creation of a completely new and unprecedented style where all that Schinkel had been studying could be brought into the progressive new. And indeed the history of building uh, and the relationship between building and music, between ideal aesthetic and harmony and number and the actual construction, the physicality of building is going to be laid out in these extraordinary bas-reliefs, all cast, not sculpted, but cast, so manufactured in Feilner's property that will wrap around the building in its frieze and also surround in didactic way the portal into this school of architecture, which is now at the center of many controversies on how Berlin ought to rebuild itself. So I will end there. I thank you for your patience, attention, and for some of you who have spent three evenings on your computer when you could have done other things in the middle of this COVID crisis. I hope you all stay well, stay engaged. I thank the ICAA and uh, Lindsay and Adrian for the invitation to uh, talk to you once again about a subject and a place that uh, for which I have a great passion. Uh, and I wish you all a good evening in the very immediate future and to find you back here again at some future time or even better that we might meet again when we can all go out and enjoy architecture, not on screen, but in reality. Good evening, thank you very much.